as powerful as Republican women. As a dear friend of mine who led our grassroots team in Texas would often remind me, Republican women are the heart and soul and brains of the Republican Party. And Robin, Adele, thank you so much for welcoming me. It is great to be here. And so, I arrived in New York yesterday. Welcome. And Mayor de Blasio promptly held a press conference and announced it. So I must be doing something right. You know, I've got to say, if Mayor de Blasio ever holds a press conference saying, I agree with Ted, that will be the instant I hang it all up and realize I've gone terribly, terribly wrong. But I have to say, I don't think that's likely anytime soon. You know, all of us are here today because our country's in crisis. Because we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids. Because our constitutional rights are under assault each and every day. And because America has receded from leadership in the world. And it's made the world a much more dangerous place. And yet I am here today with a word of hope and encouragement. All across this country, people are waking up. And help is on the way. <laughs> this next election is going to focus on three critical issues. Jobs freedom, and security. Let's start with jobs. I want to talk to all the single moms who are here, who are working two or three part-time jobs, who've had your hours forcibly reduced to 28, 29 hours a week because Obamacare kicks in at 30 hours. I want to talk to all the truck drivers, all the plumbers, and mechanics, all the union members, all the men and women with calluses on your hands, who've seen wages stagnate year after year after year. Cost of living keeps going up. Heck, we can't even afford a big gold bank. <laughs> but somehow wages don't seem to keep pace. Let me talk to all the young people coming out of school with student loans up to your eyeballs. Scared, am I gonna get a job? What does the future hold? Will I be able to provide for my family? And throughout it all, the media tries to tell us this is as good as it gets. This is the new normal. Well, let me tell you, that is an absolute lie. You know, it's easy to talk about making America great again. You can even print that in the baseball game. <laughs> but the real question is, do you understand the principles and values that made America great in the first place? <laughs> the heart of our economy isn't Washington, D.C. The heart of our economy is small businesses all across the United States of America. Two-thirds of all new jobs come from small businesses. If you want to kill the economy, you just do what we've done the last seven years. You hammer the living daylights out of small businesses. On the other hand, if you want to see the economy take off, then you take the boot of the federal government off the back of the necks of small business. If I'm elected president, we will repeal every word of Obama. It's the big 
biggest job killer in America, and in its place we will pass common sense health care reform that makes health insurance personal and portable and affordable and keeps government from getting in between us and our doctors. And we will pass a simple flat tax. That lets every American fill out our taxes on a postcard. And when we do that, we should abolish the IRS. We're going to rein in the EPA and the CFPB and the alphabet soup of federal agencies that are descended like locusts and small businesses killing jobs all across this country. And we are going to stop amnesty and secure the borders and end sanctuary cities. Let me tell you what's going to happen when we do all of that. We're going to see millions upon millions of new high-paying jobs. We're going to see wages rising for Americans all across this country. We're going to see young people coming out of school with two, three, four, five job opportunities. <laughs> We'll see mourning in America again. The second critical issue in this election is freedom. You know, just a few weeks ago, Justice Scalia's passing underscored the stakes of this election. It is not one branch, but two branches of government that hang in the balance. We are one Supreme Court justice away from a radical five-justice liberal majority, the likes of which this country has never seen. We are one justice away from the Supreme Court stripping the religious liberty from Americans all across this country. We are one justice away from the Supreme Court effectively erasing the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights. We are one justice away from the Supreme Court making us subject to the world court and the United Nations and international law and giving away U.S. sovereignty. Now, you know, a couple of debates ago, we had a question from Hugh Hewitt about the Supreme Court and religious liberty. And Donald Trump turned to me and he said, Ted, I've known a lot more politicians than you have. Now, in that, he is correct. <laughs> Donald Trump has been supporting left-wing liberal Democratic politicians for 40 years. Right. I have no experience with that. <laughs> People of New York, y'all have seen firsthand the disasters that come from liberal democratic policies that are foisted on the people of New York. And yet Donald Trump over and over again has been supporting Andrew Cuomo and Hillary Clinton and Anthony Weiner. And Elliot Spitzer and Charlie Rangel. So the next time you think of all of the disastrous policies that have been foisted on the people of New York, you can thank Donald Trump for bankrolling those efforts. But you know, Donald continued. He said to me, Ted, when it comes to religious liberty in the Supreme Court, you got to learn to compromise. You got to learn to cut deals with Democrats and go along to get along. Well, let me be very, very clear to the men and women of New York. 
I will not compromise away your religious liberty. And I will not compromise away your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And you have my solemn commitment that every justice I appoint to the Supreme Court will be a principled constitutionalist, faithful to the law, who will ferociously protect the Bill of Rights. The third critical issue in this election is security. You know, yesterday we were all horrified watching the terror attack unfold in Brussels. And it underscored the magnitude of the threats we face. What happened in Brussels was not an isolated event. It was not a lone wolf. Rather, it was part of a global jihad being waged by radical Islamic terrorists. And for seven years, we've had an administration that refuses even to say the words. Radical Islamic terrorism. Instead, President Obama and Hillary Clinton and the entire Washington Democratic Party is so enthralled by political correctness that when there's a terror attack in Paris, when there's a terror attack in San Bernardino, the president goes on a national television conference and lectures America on Islamophobia. Enough is enough. How about a president that defends America? For seven years, we've had an administration that abandons our friends and allies and that shows weakness and appeasement to our enemies. At that same debate, two debates ago, Donald Trump explained if he were president, he would be, quote, neutral between Israel and the Palestinians. But let me be very, very clear. As president, I will not be neutral. Apologetically with the nation of Israel. can't tell the difference between our friends and our enemies. Anyone who cannot tell the difference between the state of Israel, between the IDF, between the brave soldiers that protect innocent civilians and that stand resolutely with America, and Islamic terrorists who want to murder us, that raises real questions about their fitness and judgment to be commander-in-chief. Not only will we stand by our friends and allies, and I would note, by the way, two days ago, Donald Trump suggested that America should withdraw from NATO. Now, there's a technical term for that. It's called nuts. <laughs> recognize this foreign policy stuff is complicated. <laughs> and after all, Donald Trump is a man who reads a speech from a teleprompter and does not know that the name of Israel is not Palestine. <laughs> But withdrawing from NATO 
would be a tremendous victory for Putin. It would be a tremendous victory for ISIS. ISIS would dance in the streets. And the idea that we would have a president who would begin his tenure by unilateral surrender and withdrawing from the world, abandoning Europe, abandoning Israel, abandoning the world, We've seen that for seven years. We've seen leading from behind. It doesn't work and it results in American lives being lost. Right. right. We need instead a president that recognizes the threat of radical Islamic terrorism. A president who resolves not to weaken, not to undermine, but to utterly and completely destroy ISIS. something to the mayor that may sound very surprising and foreign to him. Given a choice between terrorists and criminals on one side and the brave men and women of law enforcement, I will stand with law enforcement every second. <laughs> on Mayor de Blasio. They spoke not just for the men and women of New York, but for Americans all across the state. seven years we've had a president and attorney general who vilify, who demonize, who attack law enforcement, who attack police officers and firefighters and first responders. Well, mark my words, in January 2017, that will end. At the same time, we have seen our military profoundly degraded. Readiness undermined, morale in the military plummeted. And you know, we've seen this before in this country. We've seen another left-wing Democratic president, Jimmy Carter, weaken and undermine the military. And then in January 1981, Ronald Reagan came into office. What did Reagan do? He cut taxes, he lifted regulations. We saw the economy take off millions of high paying jobs. It generated trillions in new government revenue and Reagan used that revenue to rebuild the military to bankrupt the Soviet Union. And win the do the exact same thing with radical Islamic terror.
We're going to repeal Obamacare, pass a flat tax, pull back the regulators. Small businesses will explode. Millions of new jobs. It'll generate trillions of new revenue. And we will use that revenue to rebuild this military so it remains the mightiest fighting force on the planet. <laughs> has been this president sending our fighting men and women into combat with rules of engagement so strict that their arms are tied behind their backs, that they cannot fight, they cannot win, they cannot defend themselves or defeat the enemy. That is wrong. It is immoral. And in January 2017, once again, the Commander-in-Chief will say to every soldier and sailor and airman and Marine, I've got your back. <laughs> America has always been reluctant to use military force. We are slow to anger. But if and when military force is needed, we should use overwhelming power, kill the enemy, and then get the heck out! So let's talk a little politics. <laughs> A year ago today, we launched our presidential campaign. A year ago, there were 17 Republican candidates in the field. It was an incredibly diverse, young, dynamic, talented field. What a contrast with the Democrats. <laughs> I mean, the Democrats have a wild-eyed socialist with ideas dangerous for America and the world, and Bernie Sanders. But what we've seen over the last year is the field is narrowed. And it's narrowed and it's narrowed. The primaries have done what they're supposed to do. As we stand here today, there is only one campaign that has beaten Donald Trump over and over and over again. <laughs> was an election in the state of Utah. We were hoping, we were hoping very much to break 50%. Now Donald Trump campaigned hard in the state of Utah. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, we didn't get 50% in Utah. We got 69%. And Utah marks now the 10th state where we have beaten Donald Trump all across this country. So I want to take a minute to speak to the 65 to 70 percent of Republicans nationwide who recognize that Donald Trump is not the best candidate to go head to head against Hillary Clinton. That Donald loses to Hillary Clinton. Indeed, Donald may be the only person on the face of the planet Hillary Clinton can actually beat in a general election. <laughs> what we are seeing happening all across
across this country as Republicans are uniting behind our campaign. Republicans are coming together and uniting behind our campaign. In the last 10 days, our campaign has been supported by Jeb Bush. Mitt Romney, Lindsey Graham, Mike Lee, and Mark Levin. Now, if you want to talk about the full spectrum of the Republican Party, as broad and ideologically diverse as you could imagine, that's it. You know, I have to say, a couple of days ago, my colleague Lindsey Graham hosted an event for me at APAC. And that really was a first for me. I'd never before had an event hosted by someone who three weeks earlier publicly called for my murder. <laughs> but what we're seeing is that old Reagan coalition coming together. Yeah. Across the spectrum, Republicans are uniting. Independents are uniting. Libertarians are uniting. Democrats who are tired of what we're doing are uniting. And let me tell you, New York is going to be a battleground. since the state of New York had a voice nationally in selecting the Republican nominee. We are competing hard in the state of New York. And I gotta say, I think we have an inherent advantage. Because the people of New York no, Donald Trump. <laughs> and this campaign is a grassroots campaign. <laughs> New York will be decided congressional district by congressional district on the ground all across the state. We are building a grassroots army. And this race will be decided friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, New Yorker to New Yorker, who are fed up with Washington and are saying, enough is enough is enough. You know, for all of us here, freedom is not some abstract concept that we read about in the school. Freedom is real, it's personal, in our lives, in our families. You know, for me, I think about my mom. My mom is Irish Italian. Grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. Working class family. Her mom was the second youngest of 17 kids. They were Irish Catholic. <laughs> they didn't know what else to do on a Saturday night. <laughs> My mom became the first person in her family ever to go to college. Now, my mother's father, my grandfather, was a difficult man. He was a drunk. And he didn't think women should be educated. And he especially didn't think his daughter should be the first person in the family to go to college. Well, my mom stood up to her dad. She ended up going to Rice University and graduating with a degree in math in 1956. She then became a computer programmer at Shell. Now you want to talk about two industries, computer science and oil and gas, neither one of which were very welcoming to women. And my mom was at the intersection of both. And my mom has told me many times that she very deliberately didn't learn how to type. 
<laughs> she said, look, it was the 1950s. I understood the world I was living in. She said, I didn't want to be walking down the hall and have a man stop me. Say, sweetheart, would you take this? <laughs> My mom wanted to be able to smile very, very sweetly and with a clean conscience. I said, I would love to help you out. But I don't know how to tell you. <laughs> I guess you're going to have to use me as a computer programmer instead. <laughs> My mom turned 81 last year. And she is a woman of incredible principle. She's been a best friend of me my whole life. She is an incredibly loving grandmother to our two little girls, Caroline and Catherine, and a role model and example that anyone in America can do anything. And I also think about my dad. My dad was born and raised in Cuba. As a kid, my dad fought in the Cuban Revolution, and he was imprisoned and tortured as a teenager. He fled Cuba, he fled Batista in 1957, he came to America, and he was just 18. He was penniless, had $100 that was sewn into his underwear. I don't actually advise carrying money in your underwear. <laughs> And he got a job washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. And my dad worked seven days a week. He paid his way through school. He and my mom went on to start a small business together. And so I grew up in Texas as the son of two small business owners. I saw the ups and downs, the triumphs and challenges of running a small family business. Today, my dad is a pastor. He travels the country preaching the gospel. Amen. When I was a kid, my dad used to say to me over and over again, when we faced oppression in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? give up on our children and grandchildren. And I ask every one of you to stand with us, to join with us. It took Jimmy Carter to give us Ronald Reagan. And I am convinced the most long-lasting legacy of Barack Obama it's going to be a new generation of leaders in the Republican Party who stand and fight for liberty.